Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today, uh, inshallah, we'll talk about biomes, okay? And, and briefly mentioning, it's really a very superficial study of biomes for us, in the, um, but we have to start somewhere, right? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, a biome. What is a biome? Biome is a large group of ecosystems that share the same type of climax communities. So, in other words, uh, climax communities that look similar, they're kind of huddled together across a certain geographic area like this, okay? And combine them all together, all these ecosystems with the same climax community. In other words, same looking type of communities, same looking type of ecosystems combined in the same geographic area is called a biome, okay? So, different people classify biomes differently. Uh, uh, and um, to me, it doesn't matter if, as long as I get a, uh, uh, a general overview of the different types of biomes that is personally sufficient uh, uh, for me. If somebody is an expert at this, I'm sure there are many nuances to this. But we're going to just get a general good feel for what the biomes are. For example, look at this. If you see a savanna, that's if you think about savanna, that's what you think about. You think of a desert, that's kind of what you think about. If you think about tundra, if you hear the word tundra, you, you start to shiver kind of thing. If you think about a temperate rainforest, you kind of think about that, right? So tropical rainforest, marine rainforest, tiger, and freshwater. So these are examples of biome. And if you look at these pictures, what the, the thing about these pictures, they have a certain feel for them, right? If you're walking in the savanna, for example, you could walk for miles, it would kind of look like this, right? It would obviously look different from scene to scene, but it would never change from a savanna all the way up to tundra, like in the next five miles or something like that, right? So biomes are very similar areas, uh, uh, and uh, one biome to another biome, you see some very distinct changes from one to another. Now, if you look at this uh, big picture, these are the main biomes of the earth, okay? And one of the things that I find is striking, I hope you, uh, you agree, is that the biomes are kind of like arranged according to uh, uh, um, latitudes, right? Like this purple color goes all the way, that's the tundra, okay? The green color, which is a taiga, is below it, right? So it kind of seems to go like uh, lengthways or uh, uh, um, uh, in latitudes, kind of like, right? And uh, so these are some of the major biomes, okay? The, the tundra and taiga, the two top ones, as you easy to remember, the two top ones, you like that? T and T, tundra and taiga. So the two top tundra taiga biomes. So tundra is like frigid cold. Taiga is frigid cold, but not as frigid as the tundra. So the tundra and taiga, so most of Canada, for example, is like taiga, okay? Uh, so tundra and taiga. All right, and then there's uh, deciduous forest areas, and then uh, this is tropical rainforest, okay, and uh, the savannas over here, and African savannas, and the absolute deserts over there. All right, so now before we have talked about uh, biomes, aquatic and terrestrial biomes, right? So uh, those are some examples of terrestrial biomes. These are some aquatic biomes, water biomes, is a fresh water and marine water. Remember we said marine is another word for salt water, right? In fresh water biomes, there are lakes and ponds, wetland, estuaries, we should study those, those are interesting, thing, and rivers, okay? These are all fresh water biomes, okay? And the marine biomes are like, you know, coral reefs and oceans, etc., okay? So, before we get into terrestrial biomes, we're going to talk about some, you know, uh, marine biomes, uh, so, uh, so, some uh, aquatic biomes. So, marine biomes, of course, saltwater biomes, okay, these are oceans, uh, coral reefs, estuaries, seas, and some inland lakes. Uh, freshwater biomes are rivers, streams, ponds, and most lakes, we understand that, I think, right? Now, the interesting thing about marine biomes is this, okay, so, as you know, oceans can be pretty deep. Right? Oceans can be pretty deep. Now, different parts of the oceans have diff uh, are, are different in the biotic and abiotic factors. Okay? In other words, not all oceans is the same. It's, we think all oceans are like the same, right? No, it's not actually the same. Okay? The life that exists in oceans depends, for example, on the depth in the ocean. 
Okay, some of the fishies that you see in the ocean, really, you will only see them on the surface. And some of the fishies are so, you'll never see them on the surface. They're all deep in the ocean, okay? So they deep, uh, so, so some of the factors are different. And the biotic, biotic fact, for example, salinity, the salt, the amount of salt that exists is different in different areas. Depth um, and uh, availability of light, for example. Uh, light, uh, it does not go all the way deep down into the ocean. After a while, it gets pretty dark. Light doesn't go all the way down. So the part of the, the, the oceans that, that are per, permeate light or uh, that have light, that's called the photic zone of the, of the ocean, okay? Photic zone, light available. And the part of the oceans that don't have light, that's called the aphotic zone, okay? And the life in those two parts of the, uh, of the marine biomes is very, very different. So water in general can be divided in two parts, okay? The top layer, where the sunlight hits the ocean, sunlight does not permeate the ocean all the way through, because, you know, sunlight is sunlight, right? So, and then after a certain photic zone, beneath it is a photic zone, it's pretty dark. It's just like if you turn the lights off, it's that dark, okay? So, and these factors determine what kind of living creatures exist in those areas. Also, oceans that are open water, have different living creatures and different uh, 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 different ecosystems than uh, then closer towards land. The part of the uh, uh, marine uh, biomes that are closer toward land, these are called littoral zones, or uh, closer uh, hugging the land, so to speak, littoral zones. And as you can imagine, because of the uh, uh, of the earth going like this, there's submerged plants and etc. that give rise to different habitats and. Uh, and different environments. So the life in the littoral zones is very different than the life in the open water in the oceans. Okay, does that make sense? So uh, the point of all of that is that o oceans are not like one homogeneous environment. It's not like everything is the same. It's like, you know, if you sample one part of the ocean, doesn't mean that's the, that's the sample another part of the ocean is going to be the same. Actually, very possibly very, very different depending on where you sample, etc. Now, estuaries are very interesting things, okay? Now, as you know, fresh water has to mix with salt water, right? So rivers and so they end in oceans, right? So where fresh water meets salt water, the area where they mix, that's called an estuary, okay? And so they have some very unique and interesting and curious features. So estuaries, they're coastal body waters partially surrounded by land in which fresh and salt water mix. So it's kind of like a hybrid environment of fresh and salt water, right? So, in, and, and this actually gives rise to certain interesting uh, environmental uh, phenomena. So these are some examples of estuaries, okay? So uh, uh, a cord grass, for example, and salt marshes like this, and uh, eelgrass, these are all very peculiar uh, to Estuaries. If you see these, if you see our cord grass, you can go to Florida or whatever. You see these cord grass and salt marshes, and this, you you are you are uh, seeing estuary. Now eelgrass is named eelgrass because it kind of looks like an eel. Okay, it's an eel. Okay, estuaries. Uh, they have salt tolerant, smooth cord grass. In other words, these these grasses they are able to tolerate a certain amount of salt. Okay. And, and the roots are very interesting. The roots are all matted together. They're like one big giant root for all of these. They're all matted together. You try to put one of those on, you, good luck to you. Right? So they're all matted together. And the, they're interesting because because of the tangled mat, they, they trap food, okay? They trap the organisms. And they tend to be nursery habitats for small males, uh, uh, small snails, crabs, and shrimp. In other words, they're like little, you know, babysitting nurseries for, for small snails, crabs, and shrimps. Okay, uh, it's kind of like kindergarten you know, for for snails. Look, here's snails. See, you go look in there. This is like little tiny baby nurseries for for small right? snails and shrimp and stuff. Yeah, they're like kindergarten, kindergarten for all these little creatures, nursery habitat and so. On. Now, you might think that some other organisms might have smartened up to this, right? Oh, that's a nursery. Yum, yum, right? You would think that that's the case. Of course that's the case. So other animals, either wisen up to it, other fishies and birds and things. So these nursery habitats themselves attract predators, and they create a very unique ecosystem of their own. 
So the ecosystem of an estuary, as you can imagine, is very different from other uh, 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 marine um, or, or aquatic biomes. Does that make sense? Because of this peculiar phenomenon that occurs over there. Okay, then another thing of all things, we, next we're going to talk about tides and after planetary motion across Jupiter. I'm just kidding, I'm not talking about Jupiter. But what are, what are we doing talking about tides? Tides are important because tides affect, obviously, waves, but they also create some unique, interesting ecosystems, okay? So what happens with, because of the effects of the moon, okay? Uh, the sun also causes the tide, but the moon has a greater, greater uh, effect in the tides. The moon causes a gravitational pull uh, on the water, on both sides of the earth, by the way. Uh, both sides of the earth. So there are tides that occur. For any given time, there are tides that occur pulling this... Uh, uh, water towards the moon, and how come there's a tide on the opposite side? Yeah, because this this bulge occurs to, iner to inertia. It's like if you can imagine the Earth being like a jello, right? And if you just in a, in a Earth surrounded by a water jello, if you just grab the Earth and pull, there would be some jello going backwards almost, right? That's the jello going backwards because of this inertia. So tides occur twice a day, every day on opposite sides of the earth. Okay, so watch this. So during low tide of the same day, every day there are two tides, low tide and high tide, every day. So in, late, uh, in low tide, the water level might be like at this level. Okay, water breaks at this level. And high tide, look how, f how high uh, the water level goes. Now look at this interesting over here, okay. This is low tide, okay. The same water can come all the way up to here. Can you imagine the water coming all the way up there? That's, that happens during high tide. So it's very important somebody's going on the beach to figure out what time the tide's going to come in. Because if you go on the beach over here and take a comfy nap, let's say right over here, far away from the tide, right? And they take a nice nap and there comes the high tide. Yeah? They better wake up fast, right? It'll be good to them. So, so always important. And it's always important to understand that the, that if you don't see the moon, doesn't mean you don't have a tide, right? True, false. You have to see the moon to have a tide, right? No, you don't. It's good. Because the moon could be on the other side of the earth, right? Because the tide, that's why it's twice a day, okay? So twice a day. So if you don't see the moon, doesn't mean you're not going to have a tide. So you have to ask the people over there what time the tide is going to come in, okay? Now, because of tides, now imagine... The animals are pretty smart creature. Look at all this this rock over here, right? You would think that any any life form that might be there well, might get washed away, right? You might get washed away. It was like water coming over, it's getting a nice bath every day, right? Oh, well, not so because there are special adaptations that have occurred in animals that allow them to kind of basically suck their life out like, oh, in that area, right? So there, the, you'll see that in this area, the living things they have uh, they have adaptations. That allow them to kind of like hang on to their life with their suctions and whatnot in this area. So the life in these rocky shore zones tend to be very unique, okay? Especially, look at this. The life that occurs in the intertidal zone, the life between the tides. In other words, that life that occurs from here to here, the living things that live in this area are very different than from living things that outside of these tide zones. Because they have to have those special adaptations where they, where they don't get bumped off from a tide. How cool is that? In other words, the organisms that habitat, that inhabit this area, are very special. They, you know, most of them have some, some kind of suction cups that allow them to hang tight to the rocks. Yeah? It's a cool one. I think that's cool. All right. Because the other zones, they don't have to worry about being, being washed away, right? The other thing that tides create are called tide pools. Not to conf confuse with, of course, tadpoles. They said tide pools. Now what happens is when tide comes, the big tide comes, it forms water over here and it goes away. And during the low tide, there are these pools that form, right? So this is called tide pool. We see this in, in Hawaii. That there are all these tide pools that occur, okay? And they have their own particular, believe it or not, ecosystem, little mini ecosystem over there. So these intertidal zones, see? Look at the adaptations that they have. Okay, these are all the uh, living things that have like, you know, they can survive in those intertidal zones and not be washed away by those high tides. Star, sea stars have tube feet, suction feet, remember? That hang out in that area. So where would you find these sea stars? You want to go intertidal zone? You bet you do. Go to them intertidal zone and see if you can find them sea stars, right? 
and limpets can uh, clamp down, right? Um, they, this, apparently, mussels have these attachment threads, okay? So these are various different adaptations that occur for those living things, okay? So what, that's, we talked about these particular, how different this life form is compared to the rest of the ocean, for example. And then we talked about photic and aphotic zones of marine biomes, okay? The photic zones, okay, photic zones means that area of the ocean that has, that is, a, uh, that, that is permeated by life, contains plankton. Plankton is a very important. Planktons are small organisms that float. Mm -hmm. Like you see over here, they do photosynthesis. Yeah, the small organisms that are able to do photosynthesis. Plankton. So the baleen whales uh, uh, and and other feed on plankton. Okay, whales feed on plankton. See, marine photoplankton eaten by zooplankton, and the whales feed on these. Okay, now these plankton because they do photosynthesis, they produce massive amount of oxygen. There's more water on Earth than there is plants. Three fourths of the Earth is water. So these marine phytoplanktons are, and their ability to produce water. Uh, in, uh, oxygen is actually very important, okay? And uh, because of a certain changes in the, in the oceans or because of, of uh, uh, global warming, science, some scientists worry that the whale population is going to be endangered because the whole uh, food web and food chain is going to be disturbed. So look at this. This is the photic zones. And the deeper you go, you see some very creepy things. Here it is, eh? You see this in, in Nemo, right? Funky, you see deep down, like, keep on swimming, keep on swimming, keep on swimming. Because it's so dark down that you can't see. They're in the aphotic zone, yeah? So Nemo and his buddy, you know, what's her name, Dory, go into aphotic zone and they meet up with this, you know, these funky little, looking uh, fishies, right? Keep on swimming. Okay, so... That's that. And then freshwater biomes, rivers and lakes and wetlands, etc. Streams. Okay, we should talk about the freshwater biomes. And then we'll talk a short break, okay? Sure. So freshwater ecosystem. Now you will be surprised, okay? Even in like a lake, the deeper the water is, okay? the colder it is and there's less light in it and it's less biodiverse in other words okay the deeper you go even in a small lake that you see our neighborhood life is very different in the deeper part of the lake than it is in the upper part of the lake there are more living things on the upper part of the lake than deeper part of the lake because of the differences in water okay so um um after a brief pause and these messages i'm just kidding after this uh, brief pause, we shall talk about the terrestrial biomes and so on. Okay. Until then, as-salatu wa-salam 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 wa-